How do Ohio Republicans respond to the most successful election process in state history? By changing the process, of course. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Julie Carr Smythe, State House Correspondent for the Associated Press, Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio, and Mike Ganadakis, Republican Strategist. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. Mike Thompson is off this week. I'm Ann Fisher. As of Thursday, a total of 1,080,000 plus cases of COVID-19 have been reported in Ohio since the start of the pandemic. 19,344 Ohioans have died, and nearly half of all Ohioans have started the vaccination process. And Governor Mike DeWine opened the week's briefing with the announcement that fully vaccinated nursing home and assisted care facility employees no longer need to be tested for the virus. Mike Ganadakis, that feels like a big corner to turn. Are you satisfied that the governor is loosening the rules at the appropriate pace? Uh, absolutely. And I, I would ask that he pick up the pace a little bit respectfully. Um, you know, the good news is that we have a stockpile of the vaccine. Now more people should get it. I've been vaccinated. My family's been vaccinated, of course, and uh, we don't have a shortage. Uh, we, you know, the people that, that want it or need it have gotten it. Those that don't might not get it, but I encourage everyone to get it. The good news is, Ann, is that we're opening back up as a society. As a state, we're a little bit behind Florida, Tennessee, and some other states. But the good news is, is uh, the number of deaths are dropping. The number of cases are dropping. The rate per 100,000 has dropped dramatically. Uh, I think we're down to 140 per 100,000. So it's time that we continue to get back to normal, um, continue to open up and uh, our small businesses need it. You know, we need to be able to have full capacity at our restaurants, our bars and so on and so forth. So the good news is the governor steered us out of this mess and he's done a good job, but it's now to accelerate that process and uh, to continue to get vaccinated, but continue to open up. Julie Carr Smythe, though, we're far from that 50 per 100,000 uh, that the governor was using originally as uh, kind of the benchmark for when things would open up. Right, and I think that that is kind of going to be the trick for Mike DeWine is to, you know, does he stick with that, uh, which he has said is a is a public health uh, measure that's, that's uh, you know, something that is measurable for people. But at the same time, as Mike says, you know, things are starting to open up. Everybody is beginning to compare themselves with uh, other states and their neighbors and who's getting to do what fun stuff and who's getting to uh, be able to have more uh, I, I, freedom of movement and an ability to do more things. So I think that that's kind of going to be the trick. Uh, and it has to do with um, you know, that's why the state is really encouraging people to vaccinate and trying to put on ads and campaigns to, to message that as such an important thing. And, you know, Sam Grisham, though, you know, the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on people of color and different neighborhoods, poor people, um, and reopening things is going to have a disproportionate impact as well, right? I agree with that. But the governor needs to follow science. He, he put a benchmark there um, that he should follow. Um, you shouldn't let the economics rule um, your decision making. It's the health because the health drives the economic. And I don't think most people clearly understand that. He can open it up all he wants, but if people don't feel that they're safe, they're not coming. So therefore the economics is not gonna thrive in that way. Now it is good that things are getting better. We have uh, a, a vaccination process and all of that, but it's premature. We're moving too fast because of our, our greed. And I don't think, and the point that you raised, nobody's looking at that point, the disproportional effect on people of color. They don't even put that statistic on that dashboard. But when it's all over, they're gonna have to deal with that. You know, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, that and when it comes to that, what kind of impact it has when it's not publicized in that way, do you think, Sam Gresham, when it's not on the dashboard? It tells me that they're trying to hide the fact that then when the data is revealed, uh, African-Americans and other people of color would have died prematurely at a higher level and 
to make it even worse, there was no special emphasis to do prevention in those communities or special vaccination efforts. So the data is going to reveal all of that, and it's going to be very uh, shameful. The time will tell on that. Uh, for now, a record 5.8 million voters cast ballots in Ohio last year. Many cast them early, many cast them by mail, many in person. There were very few problems, no reports of fraud. Republican Secretary of State Frank LaRose called it Ohio's most successful election ever. The Republican candidate for president won the state easily. So what do Republicans at the State House want to do? overhaul that very successful process with a litany of changes that include a call for two forms of ID to vote early or by mail, limits on ballot drop boxes, and a ban on state-funded postage for absentee ballots. Alex Fisher, the head of the Columbus Partnership, it's a, a big company executives in an op-ed in the dispatch this week, warned lawmakers to temper their meddling. Julie Carsmythe, voting rights advocates are comparing the Ohio bill to the controversial measure in Georgia and not in a good way. How are Republicans justifying the changes in Ohio at this point? Well, I mean, the the changes that are in this bill, uh, I would I would not say it goes as far as the Georgia measure. I also would say that many of the changes in this bill were things I wrote about extensively last year. Uh, the postage issue clearly needed clarification, um, and the uh, the fact that they're eliminating the Monday uh, of early voting before the election has been a long cry from bipartisan boards of elections. Um, the ballot drop box issue is extensively litigated last year, and clearly uh, we had a couple competing court uh, rulings on that. So in those ways, uh, this is addressing actual issues that arose. Uh, I would say that the way uh, the sponsors have come down in terms of the solutions, uh, they, they are not liberalizing any of that. They are, they are defaulting to the most uh, restrictive uh, answers to those questions. So they are questions that needed to be answered. But uh, on balance, you know, they've, they've reduced or restricted rather than opened up and added. Michael Ganadakis, what do you make of Alex Fisher's warning to lawmakers not to meddle? Does it suggest more activism from corporate America, from corporate Ohio, uh, much that, like what occurred in Georgia? Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, of course, and so is Mr. Fisher. But Mr. Fisher is an elected official. He can obviously run for office if he wants, put his name on a ballot and step up. His job is to represent big corporations, not you and me, but big corporations, and they tend to be more liberal in nature, so he's going to have a liberal bent to it. So I don't believe his voice is going to move the needle at all at the State House. Julie just did a fantastic job of analyzing what that bill is, and I can't stress enough she did how good of a job that was, because if you just look at, well, we don't have a bill yet, so we're speculating on what it actually says, so keep that in mind. Uh, there is no language out there yet, but when I hear that we're reducing the number of days to vote, both Democrats and Republicans who run our 88 County Board of Elections went to the legislature and said, please don't let people be able to vote the day before because we need that day to get ready for the big Tuesday uh, when people actually show up. So Democrats and Republicans came together. That's one issue in the bill, not the only issue, of course. And the other ones, as Julie said, you know, we need a clarification. The Secretary of State only has the authority that the legislature gives them when they, when they uh, draft the law. There was so much ambiguity in election law you know, uh, uh, Frank LaRose's hands were tied. He did do a great job. So this will clarify it. And Julie's right. It is more restrictive as opposed to liberal, but it's the right thing to do. And Sam Gresham, uh, Republicans call this a bipartisan issue. I saw reference to that. It's it's not. I mean, but it does include a lot of things that Democrats were calling for and the clarifications um, as well. So uh, what what do you make of it? I mean, and, and the more restrictive nature, the, the restrictive route that they went. Well, first I'll describe it as a chameleon. It's a camouflage. For it, there was no need for any changes in any aspect. May, okay, I'll take the Monday thing because you got to get prepared for the election on the next day. But I don't understand why you have to have 24 hour surveillance of a drop box. Why are you reducing the drop boxes by 20 fewer days? Why are you defining uh, uh, or eliminating the, the types of IDs you can have and stacking it up. What that does is reduce the number of people who want to participate in the process. There's nothing but obstacles here, nothing but obstacles. 
camouflaged in a few things that some people would have liked to have seen. There was no need. This is a bill that's looking for a reason to exist. There are no reasons substantiated or justify this bill. As far as we know, Julie Carr Smythe, um, that takes away some powers of the Secretary of State to make determinations about things like how many drop boxes there should be or where they can be located, right? That was something that was certain. There were, that's what, what there were a few couple or a di couple different court rulings on, right? Right. The, in the, what ended up happening with the drop boxes is that after a lengthy court battle in, in both federal and uh, county courts, um, you know, the courts did clarify that uh, Frank LaRose had the ability and the authority to expand drop boxes to multiple locations per county. Um, however, they also upheld his existing rule, which said that it, they could only be in one location. So they did not really settle the question, which is why this bill seems to want to answer that. Like I say, though, they didn't go for the multiple drop boxes, which is what Democrats would like to see at places like uh, libraries or post offices or something else. On the shrinking of the um, window for absentee ballots, again, you know, that was a problematic thing. So we were allowing people to request a ballot so close to election day, which was, you know, very uh, generous of Ohio, that they couldn't even get the ballot through the mail and get it back without risking that ballot showing up uh, late and not being counted. However, you know, as Democrats said, did they have to push it back a full seven days? Could they have pu pushed it back two days or three days? So again, it's, it, you know, on balance, it's, it, it falls on the more restrictive side, but they were legitimate issues that needed to be addressed. The Ohio Voter Rights Coalition criticized um, some of what they see as barriers. And one is they're saying that as far as we know now, it makes it harder for active duty military voters overseas to vote. Do you know what they're talking about on that score, Julie? I'm friend. I'm sorry, Sam? No, go ahead, Julie, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the the timelines for absentee and mail ballots are are shrunk a little bit, and so okay. and also the ID re requirements are increased for. Now, it does add a whole system for uh, registering for a mail-in ballot online, which people have been asking for for a long time, uh, but then it sets up a dual. Uh, authentication system, which many of us are familiar with, where you know you you get asked twice to to prove your identity. Uh, we already use that system for voter registration uh, online, uh, but uh, if you were requesting it last year, you did not have to have those identifications. And so all these things make it a little tougher, I would guess, with, if you're overseas uh, in the military. And um, Mike Ganadakis, um what about the issue of drop boxes? Uh, why, what are your thoughts about limiting them to being at boards of elections? Because in some state cities, they're very, or I mean, sorry, in some counties, that could, that could be miles. That can be an hour away from where somebody lives. Uh, I would argue that, you know, we did drop boxes because of COVID. Obviously, COVID is decreasing. We already just talked about that. We're getting our lives back to normal. But, um, you know, people can mail in their ballot. They don't have to drop it off. They can show up on Election Day. Um, they can show up the 28 days before. They can go to the Board of Elections and, and vote. So I'm not sure why we're so obsessed with drop boxes. And, I mean, we have a Board of Elections. That's where you vote, whether in person or, or, or otherwise. Put the drop box out front if someone doesn't want to walk in because they're worried about COVID or whatever the case is. And then off we go. I, I just don't understand what the obsession is about drop boxes. Sam, do you have a thoughts about an obsession? Yes, I understand the obsession about drop boxes because they're convenient. It will uh, make it easier for, for people to exercise their franchise of vote if they're conveniently located. Now, I could give you my whole theory about uh, precinct voting drop boxes, but let it go. I, I think the onerous part of the drop box, why does it need a 24-hour surveillance? And what does that mean? Does that mean somebody's got to stand there? You got to have a set of cameras to look at it? I think that's an onerous addition that's not absolutely necessary. And I think the idea of drop boxes is that poor people, students, and people of color would use them more 
than the general community. So therefore, they want to eliminate them. Not everything's about race, Sam. Well, you can't tell that from my face. Oh, I just did. Well, yeah, I would add to that, though, that there are Republicans in a number of states who are also concerned about the limits on drop boxes. It was very popular with voters of both parties last year. And as we know, a lot of uh, life has was changed by some conveniences that people got to see last year. And uh, in, we've seen in a number of states with these restrictive bills, they're rethinking about the drop box issue. So um, that one's not necessarily going to be partisan when it all is said and done. And Julie, what about the uh, hearing process for this legislation? What's your sense about how fast it's gonna move? Um, I, did I, correct me if I'm wrong, they're saying sometime this summer they want it to be uh, uh, passed and in law? Right, and it's, so what we have right now is a House bill um, and they are, it seems to be priority legislation over there. Uh, but we also heard that there's a similar topic bill being created in the Senate. And so what could happen is that it would move simultaneously in both of those houses. And okay. then, you know, they would have to work out their differences. And you know, that's a matter of, of what the legislators, where they're falling. But both chambers obviously are strongly controlled by Republicans. Okay. After years of debate, Ohio Republican lawmakers are busting out a plan to offer 43-year sports betting licenses for $1 million apiece. Senator Kirk Schuring of Canton is sponsoring the legislation. He says it's not about the money. Mike Gonadakis, after years of debate, they did the obvious, put the Ohio Casino Control Commission in charge and split the proceeds mostly between schools and gaming addiction services. What was all the fuss about? Uh, well, I, it was a total gut punch this week when we, I think we were all caught off guard and by surprise by this, I, I think it's a, it's, you know, it's a disservice to social conservatives. I think people of faith uh, to see that we're going to expand gambling. This would be the largest expansion of gambling in our state's history, more than when we did the casinos, in my opinion, at least. And uh, I'm not even sure it's constitutional because what the voters passed when they put the brick and mortar casinos in, they limited how gambling would be in our state. So we can't pass a law if it's contradictory to the constitution. So We've got a long way to go, and, and I think a lot of uh, state legislators in both the House and Senate need to talk to their constituents if they really support something like this expansion of gambling. Well, I mean, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't gambling already expanded beyond the casinos anyways? Uh, not without... I, I would say not without uh, being within the confines of the Constitution, that is, and, and what we can do with our brick and mortar casinos and racinos. I, I think it, what the expansion that's just limited around that, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, Julie uh, Carsmythe. That's what the the governor has said that, and so does uh, the, the sponsor of the legislation, Kirk Schuring, and the Senate has said, you know, we already are seeing these practices happening. We're talking about pools uh, on sports events and um, other sorts of items that are coming into the state and now are not regulated at all. So the bill is attempting that. What it looked like to me uh, was some kind of grand compromise uh, between these factions that have wanted control. Um, the Casino Commission versus the lottery uh, was a big debate that's been holding this up for a couple of years. Um, it gives little pieces of this to both. Well, it gives the main part to the Casino Commission, uh, but then lets the lottery run, run pools. Uh, it gives uh, the Attorney General some ability to expand um, charity, charitable gaming in veterans homes and that kind of thing and, and veterans clubs. So, you know, I think that it's trying to be a grand compromise, but as Mike says, there's a long way to go. Is there a long way to go? Um, and, and as far as uh, opposition to it, is it, is it uh, you know, Mike on a dock has just said there are groups that are opposed to it, but is there any sense that this is not going to go forward? Um, I, you know, I think that, yes, there are groups on both sides, well-funded. We've been already seeing quite a few uh, coming out with their own particular issues around around the way that it's been split up. Uh, so yeah, I think that uh, it will, it needs to go forward in some way to regulate uh, what's already out there. 
And we are uh, surrounded by states that have already dealt with this issue. So in some ways, Ohio needs to grapple with that. But I, I doubt that the bill that was introduced will be the last word on it. Sam Gresham, uh, Senator Shearing said it's not about the money, but obviously it's going to generate something. I mean, Ohio tends to come in at the at, in the 11th hour on these kinds of sea changes um, and then does not reap the same uh, benefits financially that other states have in, uh, when they go forward faster. My response to him, that is poppycock. It is about the money. And the most important part is who gets the money and what amount they get that money. I think all of these things are inevitable. I said that about the lottery. I said that about off-site gambling. These things are inevitable because of the greed that, um, that exists in our community and the disease of gambling that people have. Uh, just another way of getting your money. And it, it's going to happen eventually. So I, I say let's regulate it to the extent that we can and make them share the money. Now, I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on this, but would adding private schools to the list of beneficiaries be the role of government, Mike Gonadakis? I, I, I don't think that private schools get lottery funds, but I, I might be wrong. I don't think they do either. And, you know, it's a little great. And my facts are a little fuzzy there. So uh, uh, give me some wiggle room. But, yeah. uh, but I agree. That's why, you know, what was introduced and there's a lot of powerful people were up on that podium the other day. And they're all people that I respect and admire. But I think we need to pump the brakes, sit down and slow down, because the way I understand it, there was no interested party meetings before the bill was introduced. So there's so many loose ends and so many constitutional and legal problems that let's slow down. Let's sit in a room. Let's figure it out together as Ohioans. The Columbus Civilian Police Review Board is off to an unusual start. Mayor Andrew Ginther nominated nine members. Columbus City Council wanted two more, so it added them at the last minute. The size of the board is not spelled out in the city charter. And while that charter amendment aims to give the board broad disciplinary powers, that ultimately will be up to contract negotiations with the police union. Sam Gresham, do the hiccups matter at this point? I, you know, I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. The intent is very good to try and put some systems and guardrails against police officers in this community. But the way we're moving forward to it, uh, I'm a little concerned, but I think we'll get over that. I, I don't, I, I think the most important part of enforcing it, you said, I think they're going to have one heck of a time getting the police force to agree to that and their contract. So we are a long way from establishing this organization and getting it running. Um, Mike Ganadakis, uh, what do you make of the process and how do you think the process as it stands right now reflects what we might see going forward? Globally, I think the idea is good. However, when you get the politicians involved, city council and the mayor, they muck it up. And this is what we have. We have a gentleman that was just put on this committee that ripped police officers on social media right moments after we had the most recent shooting. And um, I, that type of person doesn't belong on a, on a you know non-judgmental board to review the facts. The decks are stacked against police officers in the city of Columbus. Morale is at an all-time low, which means people aren't going to be safe. Young children walking to school aren't going to be safe. We need to find a way to work together with the police officers and not always oppose them. You know, Sam, I'm wondering, are you comfortable that there's some kind of oversight of this whole thing that's going to create some consistency um, and, and standards going forward? I, I, I'm, I don't understand what Michael's talking about. Okay. Uh, Franklin County, in a study that was done in, in 2015, Franklin County had that was rated 18th for the most shootings from their police force. Most recently, we had 38 shootings, 23 of those are African-American. And then recently, from the beginning of this year to now, we have, had, we have had eight. We have a problem with our police force, and we have a problem with that police force is even in the last incident that occurred. That police officer ran to the scene with his gun out. He was not going to um, decelerate this thing. He was going to shoot somebody. And when he finally decided to shoot somebody, he shot a girl four times. He didn't need to shoot that girl four times. The police department in Franklin County has run amok, and it has committed all sorts of murders in the black community in the name of good policing. I want you to remember one thing. Policing does not occur good 
without the permission of the public. And right now, we're not giving the city of Columbus Police Department permission to police our communities without killing our people. Sam, that police okay. officer saved a young black girl's life. Don't forget that. Okay. Well, we got it's time for off the, our off the record, final off the record parting shots. Mike Ganadakis. Yeah, uh, Biden administration promised us 1 million jobs last month. Today, we just found out only 266,000 Americans bothered to get a job in the month of April. Huge difference from what Biden said we were going to have versus what we did have. We need to stop the double unemployment, all these freebies and benefits, and get America back to work because small businesses are hurting. Restaurants are closing because they can't find anyone to work. Julie Carr Smythe. Like I say, I think that the, this voting bill uh, is going to get a lot of attention and um, we're already seeing some interest in in uh, ne negotiating on some of these points. And so um, I think what will be interesting to watch is whether n Democrats get a role in this process because they also are uh, guaranteed a role in redistricting and those two might go hand in hand. And Sam Gresham. I think the community should not sleep uh, this uh, piece of legislation coming out of the state capitol on our voting rights. I think it's going to be a major piece. It is not over. There will be amendments to the process. I think it is something that the community should keep its eye on. I'm going to predict that Mike Thompson will be back next week. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We're on Facebook and Twitter. You can connect to all of that on our website. I'm Ann Fisher. Have a good week.